Amen. Number nine in your hymn book, Oh, Worship the King. Thank you for braving this bad rain. <laughs> and uh, it did rain a lot, but uh, we're glad that you're here, glad that you made it out and about, and uh, we're excited to be back in church. Thank you for being here. We're looking forward to a, a great night. We'll hear the Proclaim team uh, sing here in just a few moments from Pensacola Christian College, and you'll get to know a little bit more about them. But uh, we are so thankful that each of you, not only do we have the group from Pensacola, but uh, we have some other guests visiting with us. And so thank you so much for being our guests this evening. We're looking forward to a great time. And one of those guests, Brother David Snyder, uh, this is Brother Kyle's uh, dad and mom, Miss Barb, is here with them. And uh, we're so thankful. It's always a blessing to have them in our services with us. And uh, we, we uh, count it a privilege that they'd be here tonight. And in case you're looking for some of the staff, some of them aren't here this evening. Uh, they're all fine, but uh, they were around some folks that had uh, later tested positive, and they're just out of an abundance of caution uh, watching us online. They better be. We're going to make sure... Uh, Kyle's dad came to catch him, and here he isn't even here tonight. So um, uh, that's bad when your mom and dad have to come check up on you in church, and you're already out of college and working somewhere. But uh, they did it, and uh, but we're glad that you are here. Thank you so much for being uh, in church this evening. I'm going to ask God's blessings upon the off or upon the service. You can see where my mind's going. We're praying for the offering. I tell you, um, well, pray for the service. Ask the Lord's blessings upon it, and uh, then I believe the proclaimed team will come. And uh, bless us with some songs, and I hope that you get to know a little bit of the, get to know them, and then a little bit more about the college there in Florida. Father, bless us now as our prayer. We're certainly grateful to be in your house, dear Lord. We ask you to be with us in this meeting, uh, Lord. I pray that the me the message and song would be powerful. I pray that you would be a bless blessings, send blessings to our hearts, dear Lord. Thank you for bringing this group our way, and uh, Lord, I pray that you'd use them to minister to us, and then I pray that we could be a blessing to them as well. But bless in everything that goes on tonight. And dear Lord, we already dedicate this service to you. May you get honor from all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Once a poor sinner was traveling along. He was weary and tired, so heavy laden, tattered and torn. Then he cried for mercy, could somebody help me? And just then he knew that Jesus came through with his saving grace. Covered by mercy, cleansed by the flow. My sins were scarlet, Jesus washed them whiter than snow. There on the cross, He took my place. When He cried, it's finished, the sin that was paid. Now I am free, forever saved, mercy led grace. 
I was that sinner Wasting my life Without a purpose I had no direction And no hope in sight Then I cried for mercy Could somebody help me? And just then I knew that Jesus came through and saved me by Come grace. Come on, amen. Sing it. Covered by mercy, cleansed by the flow. Though my sins were scarlet, Jesus washed them whiter than snow. There on the cross, he took my place. When he cried, it's finished, the sin debt was paid. Now I am free, forever saved. Mercy met grace. Covered by mercy, cleansed by the flow. Though my sins were scarlet, Jesus washed them whiter than snow. There on the cross he took my place when he cried is finished our sin debt was paid now we are free forever saved mercy met grace now we are free forever saved mercy met grace mercy met grace Grace. Hey everybody, we are so excited to be here with you all tonight and just to exalt the name of Jesus. And we're going to get right back to that in a moment, but before we do, we're going to introduce ourselves so you can know us a bit better. My name is Ben Ross. I am from a little town called Random Lake, Wisconsin. Yes, it is a real place, and I'm studying music education at the college. I'm a senior marketing major. My name is Savannah McDaniel, and I am from Flowery Branch, Georgia. I'm from Carthage, North Carolina. My name is Colby Whitaker, and I'm a sophomore pastoral studies major. And then on the piano, we have Miss Mia Griffin, all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada, and she's a senior graphic design major. Hi, I'm a sophomore performance studies major. My name is Megan Smith, and I am from Buford, Georgia. This same Jesus who walked in Galilee will know this. Same Jesus who talked beside the sea will know this. Same Jesus, by faith I have been told this. Same Jesus will save your soul. Well, now this same Jesus who heard the Hebrew children, heard the Hebrew children down in Egypt land, this same Jesus will lift your burdens. This same Jesus will take your hand. Well, now this same Jesus who walked in Galilee. Well, now this same Jesus who talked beside the sea. Well, now this same Jesus by faith I have been told. This same Jesus will save your soul. Well, now this same Jesus who locked the lion's jaw. Lock the lion's jaw down in Daniel's den. This same Jesus will lift your burdens. This same Jesus will be your friend. Well, now this same Jesus who walked in Galilee. Well, now this same Jesus who talked beside the sea. Well, now this same Jesus by faith I have been told. This same Jesus will save your soul. This same Jesus who walked in Galilee, this same Jesus who talked beside the sea, this same Jesus by faith I have been told, this same Jesus will save your soul, this same Jesus will save your soul, this same Jesus will save your soul. Um, one thing that I have learned while being at college and kind of having to learn how to do life kind of on my own 
is that I can't do any of it on my own. And there are so many times when school gets stressful or things get hard and I'm like, I got this, I, I can handle it on my own. And those are the times in my life when God shows me that I absolutely cannot do it on my own. And it's those times that I have to give everything to Him. And um, I know that we all face situations like that in life. But I, our next song talks a lot about just resting in Him. And that's something big that He's taught me, is that if I just give it all to Him, and He takes care of it if I trust Him. And we can all do that. So just listen as we sing our next song. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what Thou art. I am finding out the greatness of Thy loving heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon Thee, and Thy beauty fills my soul. For by thy transforming power, thou hast made me whole. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Thy loving kindness, vaster, broader than the sea. How marvelous thy goodness lavished all on me. Yes, I rest in thee, beloved. No one wealth of grace is thine. No, thy servant of promise and have made it mine. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Jesus, I Resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving Let's all stand, number 444, in your hymn book.
Jesus. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for love or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Well, just a little bit, the Proclaim team is going to come back up and you'll learn a little bit more about the college. But um, before we do that, uh, Miss Joanna Gallion was on a mission trip and it's been just a little bit longer ago uh, than we usually like, but uh, her work schedule just dictated that she couldn't be here. Uh, a lot of the times that we would have had her just give a short recap of what went on and uh, we were praying for her and we're thankful for the safety, but also thankful for what God did. And so she's going to come up and give a verbal testimony just of what went on there. And I know there'll be a blessing to you, Miss Joanna. Well, I would like to thank the people of Buffalo Ridge for supporting me and for praying for me on this trip. It was a amazing adventure that the Lord gave me. And for those of you who don't know me, I am Joanna Gallion, and I am a nurse practitioner student. I've been a registered nurse for almost 19 years. And the Lord has burdened my heart to do as Mark 14, 8 commands, she hath done what she could. I may not be able to be a full-time missionary across the world, but the Lord has enabled me to go a couple of times a year and just to do what I can there. So in our trip this time, I went to Uganda, and earlier in the year, you may remember, I went to Ghana. Uganda is known as the Pearl of Africa, and it is one of the most temperate places in the world. Um, it is the average temperature ranges from 68 at night to 84 during the day. So it's actually a really easy um, place to get used to weather-wise, but it's a very poor country. Uh, many people are substance farmers, which means if they grow it, they get to eat it. And here you see a picture of a sweet potato field. Their sweet potatoes are not like ours. They're more of a whitish, um, more starchy consistency. Um, but that is some of the main things that people do. This field, as you can see, was actually hand dug and hand taken care of. So the people there often complained of back pain and uh, normal joint and, and back aches. So you can imagine bending over and taking care of, of red clay mud the whole time. Um, one of the things that the Lord allowed me to see um, there was just the varying types. In the cities, obviously, we had um, more normal accommodations, but as the closer we got into the bush, this is what most people lived in. The wealthy people had concrete houses with roofs, but the poor people had the, the stick houses, um, mud that was made from, from bricks. So when we run and do our clinic there, we work with a team of doctors, dentists, nurse, and optometrists, and we run it just like your normal doctor's office. People come in, they give their information, we get their blood pressure, we get their vitals, and they see providers. And um, on this trip, um, we also got to work with Maranatha Baptist University. Their students came down, and we got to um, teach them about how to do medical missions as well. One of the students got to start her first IV, and um, any of you who is nurses, this is a, definitely a huge moment in the life of a nurse. Getting to do this and getting to serve the Lord at the same time was quite the adventure for her. But the most important thing that we do there is provide medical care so that people will hear the gospel of Christ. If we touch their bodies and forget their souls, then we have wasted our time and our finances. But because of the Lord's work, 57 souls were saved. And I would just like to praise the Lord for your all's help in this, because if it wasn't for you praying and assisting, um, then I would never have been able to have been part of this. Um, some of the things that I got to do there was just to be like a provider. And as a nurse practitioner student, y'all, this was amazing. I got to do, uh, I got to see 47 patients on my own. And the Lord just brought back to me time after time different medical diagnoses, different differentials, things to work through. What medication should I order? What lab should I order? There was so much going on from a Western trained mentality to a tropical medicine. But the Lord gave the wisdom that I needed through this. 
And I got to do another joint injection. That was really cool, too. Um, but and one of the fun things was got it, also getting to perform my first minor surgery. If you watch in the States, Dr. Pimple Popper, you may know that um, excising a cyst is quite fun. And let me tell you, and if you have a squeamish stomach, look away for two slides. Um, but my supervising physician um, helped me excise a cyst off of a pastor's chest, and it was really difficult for him because they did not, they were not able to afford normal transportation, so they had to walk everywhere. And the man said the more miles that he walked, the pain in his chest just became worse. So it was a blessing to be able to get to remove this and get to do suturing. I got to learn some special uh, stitches with that, so it was just a huge blessing. Um, in this picture, I would like to tell two stories. I learned a very important lesson. Seeing seven children at the same time is not advisable. You really just can't keep them all straight. Uh, but in the very back corner, you'll see the mother holding a little boy. And this is one of those things when the Holy Spirit just whispers to you, pay attention. He came in for infected bug bites. Okay. Just a simple little thing. I could have written a little tiny prescription, talked to my doctor, and sent him on his way. But the Lord said, listen to his lungs. So I pulled out my stethoscope. And when we put a stethoscope on someone, we expect to hear a wind tunnel, just a very soft air coming in, air going out. But when I heard this little boy's lungs, it sounded like a washing machine gurgling with all of the fluid in his lungs. And he had double pneumonia. We had to give him three different antibiotics, one of which we could not even get him till the next day because obviously a boy of nine months old is not able to swallow very large pills. And my coworker turned later and looked at me and she said, Joanna, you saved that little boy's life. And it wasn't me who saved him. It was God who said, put the stethoscope on him and listen to him. And I look back and I have learned more about antibiotics on this trip, but I also learned to listen to the nudging of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, and lastly, I want to talk to you a little bit about baby Sarah. Um, some of you may have heard growing up about the starving children in Africa. And it's just one of those things you just hear. Um, but baby Sarah is truly one of those stories. As you can see on the little uh, photograph they have a uh, holding up of her, she was dropped off at um, a pastor's home. And when I say pastor, I'm saying a man who is not formally trained. He's just a man who's saved and he wants to tell people about Christ in his, in his com community. But this man lives in a thatched roof hut, dirt floors, his wife and five children. He's very, very poor, and then all of a sudden they have a sixth mouth to feed. They did not name baby Sarah for a long time, and eventually when they did, they were afraid to even call her by her name because they thought she was going to die. But the missionaries there heard about baby Sarah, and on the right you see um, one of the missionaries who was holding her. And um, when she was first there, her hair even turned gray because her body did not have enough nourishment to even grow her hair or keep it um, thick like it normally was. And so the Lord um, spoke to my heart and I said, I want to help support baby Sarah. You know, if I had not had Buffalo Ridge to help encouraging me, so many of you all gave financially, so many of you prayed. Mrs. Magnus even feeds my family uh, with her famous homemade bread. But you guys helped me be able to take care of these people. And I learned the power of prayer so much there. And every clinic day, we all gather together and we pray that the Lord will just help us, give us wisdom, that we would be the hand and the feet of Christ. So thank you. Thank you all so much um, for enabling me to serve him once more as a medical missionary. Amen. Thank you so much, Miss Joanna, for the update and just a recap of it. And thank you, as she mentioned already, and for my our point of the church, it's just a, such, a, such a blessing to see folks from right here that just get involved in the work and go somewhere across the uh, foreign land and to be used of the Lord and use your gifts and talents 
for his, for his goodness and for his glory. So praise the Lord for that. Well, I'm going to have Brother Brenda. Are you going to come and uh, they're going to sing first? Are you going to sh- say some things first? Whichever way you want it planned. All right, come on up. Brother Brendan, I got to meet him uh, at the beginning and, and this afternoon. He's going to come share a little bit about the college, and they'll come back and sing again for us. But uh, we certainly are thankful to have he and his wife, and uh, he'll introduce her before the night is over. And uh, we're certainly glad to have them as our guests. Thank you. Thank you so much, church, for having us in. It is a joy to be here. Uh, My name is Brendan Stevens, and my wife Lex is down here as well. We have the privilege of being able to lead this team, and I really do love the opportunity to do so. Um, My wife and I graduated from uh, Pensacola in May of 2020, which was an absolutely bizarre time to graduate, but it worked out. We got married, and we were able to uh, hit the road a few months afterwards, and we've been traveling for a year and a half afterwards, and it's it's been a wonderful time. But I love especially of being able to travel with the team of students and go to churches like this and be able to minister in that particular way and then share our passion for Christian education. Christian education really is a wonderful thing, uh, more and more so, I believe. And so I think it's important as well to consider for every student to consider what God might have for them personally. Something for you parents and and grandparents to consider as well uh, because oftentimes a Christian education means leaving home, which is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Uh, But if it's what God directs, it can be one of the most amazing growth experiences available. I moved from Michigan all the way down to Pensacola, and uh, there were some some bumps in the road, and some of the experiences I had were not always the easiest, but my goodness am I thankful for the growth that was available as God used the experiences that Pensacola Christian College provided for me to prepare me for uh, the influence uh, that I'm I'm able to have now and that I continue to grow in. Uh, It's a wonderful thing, preparing to influence the world for Christ and it's something that I'd encourage uh, you to consider as well. Uh, We will be here a little bit after the service. We've got our table that you may have seen on your way in, and we'd love to uh, chat with you a little bit, and some of the team share some of their experiences that they've been able to have at Pensacola. Uh, So do that if you're able to. We'd love to to spend some time with you. Uh, There's some music available back there as well. If you'd like some good Christian music, we have a great passion for that as well. Uh, So again, we'd love to speak with you. Thank you again so much for having us. Uh, The team will come up now, and they've got two more songs to share with you before we close. spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. to me there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary by God's word at last my sin I learned then I trembled at the law I spurned till my guilty soul in Roaring turn to Calvary. All oh, the love, the true salvation's plan. All oh, the grace that brought it down to man. All oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend. At Calvary, mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my rapture 
soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free at Calvary. life verses are Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And God's just been teaching me to trust in him as I'm going into my last semester of college, and that he knows the future, and he's been so faithful every step of the way. He keeps his promises, and I'm thankful that one of those promises that he kept is that he sent his only son to die on the cross for mine and your sins. And that gives us purpose in our life and allows us to realize that we should be impacting people, others, for Christ's sake. All of our lives should be about what Jesus did on the cross. I only had one song that I could sing you, one more story I could tell before I leave. If I only had one message I could bring you, there's no question it would be about the cross, about the blood, about the place I found, God's mercy and love. And although it's bittersweet, remembering the cost, there's something beautiful about the cross I could sing about the state of grace I live in or the peace and joy I've had when times are tough and you'd see in all the blessings I've been given in the end my life is just about the cross, about the blood, about the place I found, God's mercy and love. And although it's bittersweet, remembering the cost, there's something beautiful about the cross two thousand years ago if i had watched christ die i think i would have lost all hope demanding to know why but now i know his sacrifice means everything and it's the greatest honor to
again, thank you so much. There's something beautiful about the cross, and praise the Lord, as you know, that is our central focus, and that's why the cross is behind me when we remodeled the auditorium. We're so thankful, uh, of course, for the song about the cross. Well, I failed to mention earlier, I want you to be praying for... Um, I, I, I did not mention this morning. I didn't under, know till later, uh, but uh, Brother Harry Vickers' uh, sister, Janice Trent, passed away, and she was sick. We were praying for her, uh, but pra- passed away yesterday. So keep, please keep that family in your prayers, if you would, please. And uh, then we're also praying for uh, Lori Green this afternoon. She fell. She's getting in the car and uh, wet water and slick, and so she, uh, she fell, and her leg went back underneath of her. She either possibly broke her leg or her ankle there at the hospital now. So I want you to keep Lori in your prayers, if you would, please. And we've got many others to pray for. Uh, We're so thankful that um, uh, Brother Kermit Deacons had his surgery and is doing well after that. So we're keeping him in our prayers and lots of others. We'll spend some time this Wednesday, uh, Lord willing, on our prayer time and asking the Lord to bless different requests. But I want you to be aware of those ones so that you could be praying and share your uh, prayer with others to let the folks know that you are praying for them. Well, I want to preach tonight in, from First Chronicles. And uh, First Chronicles, we were in Second Chronicles this morning. And uh, First Chronicles chapter 28. And uh, while you're finding your place there, uh, I did hear this story while I was, sometimes like to start off with something funny. And I heard about this little old lady. She was uh, trying to put this, together this jigsaw puzzle. She dumped all the pieces out of this big table, couldn't make heads or tails of any of it. So she called her neighbor and said, you're going to have to come over here and help me with this. And she said, okay, well, what's your puzzle supposed to be? He said, well, according to the box, it's a rooster, big rooster. I want to help, help me put this chicken together. And so her neighbor came back over and she looked to where all the pieces were sp- sprawled out there on the table. And she said, well, looked at him for a little bit and turned to her and said, first of all, I don't want you to be upset, but I don't think we're going to be able to put any of these things back together to make them look like anything like a rooster. She said, well, okay. Took her by the hand and said, I'll tell you what, let's just relax. Why don't you sit here? Let's get a cup of coffee. And then the first thing we're going to do is put all these cornflakes back in the box. I didn't use that in the morning because I didn't know if everybody knew what the rooster is, the big rooster on cornflakes. So... You're welcome. That, this was a Sunday night joke because I was afraid it might go over the heads of some folks. So, and for all of you who are sitting there waiting, tutorial, I should have had a picture up on the wall of cornflakes, as far as I know, still has a picture of the rooster on it. So you're welcome. First Chronicles chapter 28. We're looking at the place where Solomon is getting charged by his dad, David, to build the temple after David's gone. Verse number 9 of First Chronicles 28, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take thee now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house For the sanctuary, be strong and do it. I want to preach for just a little while. It's 15 after 7 already. I want to preach for just a few moments about this. Serving with a perfect heart. The story goes that David wanted to build that temple. He wanted to build it bad. He wanted to build, and so much so that the, uh, the prophet said, yep, sounds good to me, go for it. And God instructed the prophet and said, no, tell him that that won't be for him. He's a, been too much war, a bloody man. And so David gets the brakes put on his desire. And so there's a great lesson there, but that's not what I'm preaching tonight. And the great lesson is sometimes you don't get to do what you want to do, but if you're not going to get what you want to do, then you ought to certainly help somebody else do what God God wants them to do. There's been many a many a pa- or many a father, I should say, that had a great desire to do something, but because of difficulties in their life, maybe some circumstances, maybe um, maybe some sin that they got involved in and got right with God, and they desperately wanted to do something big, but they could not. And so what they did was they said, "I, can, I may not be a king, but I'm going to make me a king. I may not be able to do something that I want to do, but I'm going to help somebody else find out what they can do for the Lord." Somebody said it like this. If you give enough people what they want in life, you will get what you want in life if you'll help push them up. And so there's a great lesson there, but here I want you to see this aspect of it tonight as I preach for just a few moments about are you serving with a perfect heart? 
Because that's what God uses David to tell Solomon to serve the Lord with this perfect heart. And he admonishes David, or admonishes his son to glorify God by building the temple, to serve him, but to do it with a perfect heart in verse number nine. And what that means is a complete or a full heart wholehearted. Your dad probably told you the same thing that my dad told me. If a job's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Don't mess around and do something half-hearted, son. Make sure you're going to do it. If you're not going to do it, then go do something else. Dad, I can't tell you the times he's preached that sermon. If you're not going to work for this fella, don't take his money. You boys, I've got two brothers. If you boys are going to work, then you go, to, you go work, and you work all that he wants and then some if you're ever going to take a dime from him. If you're not going to do that, then don't steal his money. And he said, you do it with a whole heart. And so I want to preach for just a little while about this this evening, about are we serving with a perfect heart? Father, bless us now in these moments you've given us. Lord, you've overcome a lot in our service tonight. Give us some great uh, guests here, and they've sung, and they've blessed our hearts. Lord, we had to overcome the rain, and we're so fickle, and uh, we, uh, you've, you've helped us overcome that. You've helped us overcome so many things, dear Lord. You've risen us to this occasion. Now, I pray that you would speak to our hearts through your word. Bless us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I just take a little poll. How many of you love to come to a church in the rain? Not me. I'd rather be sunshiny. You, wait, how many of you love to have rain over clear skies? There's a few. I know there are. <laughs> they're strange, but uh, no, they're not. They're not. They're not. That's fine. That's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. Um, might be wrong, but it's a, you're entitled. We're all entitled to it. Wouldn't we rather come when it's nice? We'd rather come, I, I love to come to church in the summertime because it's still daylight and we can be, uh, we can go to, uh, go get ice cream after church and still be daylight even then. But it's not. And now it's not even dry. It's wet. It's raining. And uh, uh, this afternoon, I, like you, thought, boy, oh boy, is that rain? And sure enough, it was just pouring it down. And all that affects how we feel. But I'm so thankful that you come to church. I'm so thankful that you sing. I'm so thankful that you say, well, it doesn't matter how it is on the outside. The Lord can certainly do something good on the inside. And I'm so grateful for that. And I'm more, even more grateful than I am for you. I'm grateful for God who blesses us and he gets in what's going on. It's just a blessing to be in church. But with that being said, it is a little tough on Brother Dan sometimes. It's hard for him to get us uh, revved up. If that's a music director's job, you're revved up. Hard to get, hard to pull it out, but I've watched him do it again and again, and I'm so thankful for him and thankful for uh, what he does, but thankful for what God does, and that illustrates what I'm talking about. I've never seen Brother Dan come and give a half-hearted attempt. Oh, I've, I've seen him lead music a lot here, but I've seen him for years do it in other places. I've never seen him do it half-hearted, and that's what I illustrate with tonight to say whatever we're going to do, we ought to do it with a, as the Word of God says, a full and a complete heart, I believe it says. And we realize there that our, uh, for the Lord searcheth the hearts in a perfect heart and with a willing mind. I want you to think about this for a couple of times as we look at it. As I told you, my dad told me the same thing that probably some in your life said, and that is if you're going to have jobs worth doing, it's worth doing right. I want you to see, first of all, we all have a work to do. In verse number 10, the Bible says, take heed to now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house. I believe that God has left us all here to do something for Him. I believe as you raise your children, you ought to raise them for Him. I believe that you're not there to provide food, clothing, shelter only. You are supposed to do that. You're supposed to do that, but every unsaved parent is, does that as well. Most of them know they should. You're supposed to not only provide food, clothing, shelter, but then raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and teach them that they are fearfully and wonderfully made and teach them that God has has something big for them to do because every life that's on this earth, God has a plan, a purpose, and so many of our young people in our schools across this land have been taught that they are just accidents and there's nothing out there that they're supposed to do. They don't worship anybody. They only worship themselves, the creator, uh, the creation more than the creator, and they find themselves with no purpose. Is it any wonder? 
But you as a parent and I as a parent have the job of instilling in every child that resides in our home that they have a job to do. Verse number 10 says, take heed to now, the Lord hath chosen thee to build. You and I weren't supposed to build a temple. You and I weren't supposed to build a house of worship necessarily, but you and I were chosen to do something. You say, preacher, I don't know what I'm chosen to do. Well, if you've got a spouse, you're chosen to love that spouse as, as Christ also loved the church. If you've got children, you're commanded to raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. If you've got, if, if you're saved, you're commanded to walk humbly before God. There's so many commands that we have that the Lord has something for us to do. Scientists say all of us can taste, except unless you have this COVID, I guess, but all of us can taste. But some people, 25% of the population, have extra taste buds in there. There's a big fancy word for it, but, and I tried and tried and tried before I was ready to come in here this service. I listened to it on my computer, and it said, I mean, and I'm not going to say how they said it. It was, a, it was a foreign lady, and she sounded impressive, much more impressive than I would, and I almost thought about just holding my phone up to the microphone and said, here, listen to how she says it. I thought you'd think less of me, so I said, well, no, I won't do that. But then I thought, no, I can try it. I can, I can pr impress you with my ability to speak. But then I thought better of that. A trip coming out of my office so, the other day, so I thought, well, I better not do that either. But there's something that uh, you have 25% or 25% of the population, rather, has these extra things on their tongue that they have, they have extra ability to taste. I mean, they're great ones. They're very, very sensitive have those extra mushroom-shaped things on the bottom of their tongue and tastes really drive them crazy. You say, what good's that do? I don't know. I'm just saying 25% of the, of the population can taste better than the rest of us can. So we got this Proclaim team, about one or two of you have extra taste. The rest of you is just normal like us, like us folk in East Tennessee. And you say, what good's that do? I have no clue. I just know that God didn't make any mistakes. I see some folks who have developmental disabilities, and I see how they're the spark plug of their family. I see people who have health issues, and those health issues have driven them to serve the Lord and be such a sweet Christian, much sweeter than some of the old uh, cantankerous people that don't have anything wrong with them. I'm saying this evening that God has chosen all of us and has given us a work to do. But I want you to look again in verse number 10. Not only does God give us all a work to do, He says to Solomon, you've got a chosen, He's chosen thee to build a house, but part of that life should bring people to God. Let me explain what I mean by that. The Bible says to Solomon, you're supposed to build the house for a sanctuary, a sanctuary where people could come for the sanctuary, for the place to come to God. I mentioned in the message this morning, the temple was the central part of the Israelites' life. That was the hub of their existence. And Solomon was supposed to be used of God to get that out of that tabernacle, out of that tent, and into a permanent dwelling. Use it. He was supposed to be used, rather, to get people to meet with God. And I'm saying that each and every one of us, as I already alluded to this morning, each and every one of us are also supposed to be engaged in that sanctuary building, if you want, that sanctuary living, if you'd like, or we're supposed to be involved in something that points people to God. How would our lives be different this week if we realized that every restaurant, every gas station, every store, every place of business that we went to, we, were, we realized that we were on display and we were there for a purpose. I understand that doesn't mean you hop up on your table at Wendy's after you're done with your chili and say, all right, y'all, listen up over here. <laughs> They probably take you out and say, hey, listen, we've got a little, a little special place for you and have you committed somewhere. I understand. I'm not saying that you be obnoxious or you be this loud, bombastic person, but I am saying that people we rub shoulders with, we are responsible to be a good testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that the part of our life should be in that sanctuary living to bring people 
to the Lord. I believe everybody's got a purpose here. Everybody in this room has got a purpose here in this church or uh, out from this church. We're supposed, we've got a purpose to take this church outside of this church and go do something for the Lord. But there's also lots of things that we can do inside the church. We've got a purpose for that. Everybody may not work in the same area, but everybody's got an area to work on. I want to give you this last one, number three, if you look back in verse number nine. As we serve the Lord, as we find a way to point people to Christ, I get to the crux of the message tonight. As we serve, would you let it come from the heart? Look again in verse number nine. And thou, Saul, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. Have you ever been told to by some, have you ever been told, I'm sorry, by somebody who didn't mean it? Go back way to when you were a kid. If you had a brother, I've got two brothers and a sister. All of us have been told, I'm sorry, by somebody who didn't mean it. You say, what do you mean by that? You know, your mom says, hey, tell them you're sorry. Uh, 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 uh. Tell them you're sorry. Uh, I am not sorry. Well, mom says, I don't care whether you are or not. You got to say it. Lie. Your mom's teaching you to lie. I don't care whether you are. Say it. Okay. I'm sorry. Did that really change my life? <laughs> Didn't do much for me, did it? I know mom was trying to teach us. Mom was trying to show us. But if it's, not, if it's half-hearted or less, it doesn't do much for us. And you realize when we read through the Chronicles and all the other uh, Old Testament books, you see some of those uh, kings, they certainly serve the Lord half-hearted, and that might be the good one. Some of the others were much less than half. But David tells his son, I want you to serve the Lord, but I want you to do it with a perfect a complete, a total heart. If you're back when you were a teenager and you were wanting to date somebody, teenager, 21, 22, 52, whatever you're dating, I don't know, whatever age you were when you're dating, and when you want to impress that girl and you told her that you love her with all your heart, right? Hubba, hubba, I love you with all my heart. You're a cold bunch tonight. Don't you love your, didn't you love that girlfriend with all your heart? Oh, I love you with all my wallet. <laughs> that came a long time before the heart did, I know, especially when you're trying to impress her. It used to be when Amy and I were dating, we'd, I'd pay for everything. Now I try to get her to pay for anything I can get her to pay for. I <laughs> have mercy. Love you with all my wallet. No, I love you with all of my heart. And what we mean by that is everything that's in me, baby, whatever I got, it's all, all of it loves you. If I were a better, if I was a poker player, I'm putting the whole thing on you. Not that I'm condoning that, but if, I'm a, if I was a, a better, I'm putting it all on you. I love you with my whole heart. And that's what David, David says to Solomon. Love him with a perfect heart. Serve him with a perfect heart. I want to give you three reasons why you should serve with sincerity, then we'll be done. But before I give you that, I want you to, I want to give you an example. Amaziah from, uh, from 2 Chronicles 25 says this, He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but listen to this phrase, but not with a perfect heart. You can fool me. You could come in here and say, preacher, I gave, and I, you know I don't check about what people give, so it's a poor illustration. Preacher, I gave $2,000 for that, uh, for that, uh, that uh, Christmas offering for Jesus, or I gave $2,000 for this. And I would say, oh, bless your heart, praise the Lord. But the Lord knows our sincerity. You could come in here and you could say, you know what, I did, I, 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 took, one, I took that uh, big tour bus and I painted it red so it matched the brick of the church. Well, number one, we thank you not to do that. But if you grumbled the whole time and you said, oh, this church, all they want me to do is paint, paint, paint. And you didn't do it with a sincere, perfect heart. We'd rather you not painted it. Because as David told Solomon, you need to do it with a perfect or a sincere heart. And Amaziah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. If I learned something a long time ago, one time I did something wrong in our marriage. It's been so long, it's hard for me to remember, but I think it went like this. I did what was wrong. I did, I did some dumb mistake, and Amy said, well, here's what you should have said. I said, okay, that's what I'll say. And she said, no, it doesn't help now because I already told you what you're supposed to do. 
I said, well, I said the right things, but apparently men, this is free advice, if your wife has to tell you what to say, you get no credit for it. <laughs> Not at all. Right, Aim? That's right. I said, that's what you said I should have said. She said, yes, but you should have said it before I said you should have said it. I was like, let's take it back just a few years. I did that which was right, but I did not do it from a perfect heart. And I'm afraid sometimes we're serving the Lord. We're doing what's right, but we're really, I mean, on the outside, we're doing what's right. But we're not loving our family like we should with a perfect heart. Husbands, all jokes aside, your wife wants you to love her with, with sincerity, honor the Lord. And there's several folks that are getting married the next year, and I, I mean, it's exciting times. I love it. But if you find somebody and you're not convinced they're going to love you with that perfect heart, and perfect, I don't mean without mistake because none of us get that way, but that whole heart, that sincere heart, that complete heart, then dump them and go find somebody else. But that holds true also as we serve the Lord. Let's serve Him with this perfect heart and with a willing mind. Let me give you these three things of why you, can, why you should serve with sincerity. Number one, because the Lord knows. Look in verse number nine that we're looking at. You should serve Him with sincerity because number one, He knows the Lord searcheth and understands. If Amy Herbman can figure out why when I'm not sincere, well, then certainly God can figure out when I'm not sincere. You aren't fooling him. We can walk around and act like everything's great, but the Bible says the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. Why should we serve him with sincerity? Number one, because he knows. Number two, because it's possible. Look, at, look on in verse number nine. We're just going to tear the verse apart. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. So it's not like he's unfindable. It's not like he doesn't want to be discovered by you. He wants to, you to find him. He wants for you to love him. You, the Bible says you'll seek for me and find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. He wants to be found of you. He, he only wants to be sought for you or sought by you with a whole heart. Number one, serve him with sincerity because he knows. Number two, serve him with sincerity because it's possible he'll be found of thee. And number three, serve him with sincerity because there are consequences if we don't. Now, in this case, in verse number nine, he says, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. My intent tonight is not to say that he's going to cast you off forever. The people I'm speaking to tonight, by and large, you're Christians, you're saved, and, but I'm just getting you to understand that if we don't seek for him with all of our heart, there are consequences. You understand that one of the greatest or worst ways to live is regret. Do you know what one of the most sobering times in my ministry that I've ever had it was a culmination of a few visits, and these people were nursing home residents who did not serve the Lord when they had opportunity, and now regret racks their brain and their mind because now their body won't let them do it. Back then when they had body, they had no desire. Now that they have a desire, they have no body. Regret is a horrible master. So when I say there are consequences, I do not mean that salvation is in question. Of course, that's not true. But if I don't seek the Lord now, seek for Him while He may be found. Look for Him while He's near. If I choose to, out of desire to go do anything else, be it financial, lifestyle, whatever else. I don't have time right now to seek Him with all of my heart. One of these days, very likely, you'll be one of the people that I was talking about, and you'll say, oh, I wish I could now. The only problem is then you'll find, like my friends that I found, you're not able to. So why would I seek serving with sincerity? Because there are consequences if I don't. 
We all know what fake is, right? You go to any big city and there's people that are vendors and they've got cheap merchandise with expensive names from Ray-Ban sunglasses for a few bucks to Kate Spade purses for just a few more. My pastor one time, he was somewhere on a cruise and got off the uh, cruise this port and he bought a Mont Blanc pen for $10. That's quite a buy. Except he knew it wasn't a true Mont Blanc pen. So he said, like some people, when, they're, uh, when they have a classic car but it's not that great of shape, he said, John, that's a 10-footer. It looks good from about 10 foot away. <laughs> So as long as he puts his Mont Blanc pen on the shelf and nobody gets close, they still think he's got a Mont Blanc pen. It's not sincere. And sometimes I'm afraid my service for the Lord is about as insincere as that Mont Blanc pen that costs ten dollars. I want to serve him with sincerity. I want to serve him with a willing mind and a perfect heart. So I asked the question at the beginning, and I ask it as before we leave, are you serving him with a perfect heart? I hope that you are. Have you bought into the lie that you've got to be miserable? That's not true. Have you bought into the lie, well, you're too old, you're too young, you're too ordinary, you're too this, you're too that? None of that's true. What we can realize is it doesn't matter where we are right now, we ought to serve him with a perfect heart. You say, I can't do as much as I used to. God knows that. You say, I can't do as much as so-and-so. God knows that as well. But are we serving him with a perfect heart? And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou that the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. Let's serve him in that way. Father, bless us now is our prayer. Thank you for this time to be in your house. And Lord, I pray that you would help us serve you with sincerity. I pray, dear Lord, if we're doing what we do to be seen of men, that tonight, I, I don't want us to quit doing what we're doing. Lord, I just want us to have the right motives. Pastor, be foolish to get up and say, I want everybody to quit what they're doing just, to, uh, just in case. No, I want us to keep on doing what we're doing. I just want to do a motive check, dear Lord. And I can't do it on anybody else, and they can't do it on me, but we can do it on ourselves. And so I pray, dear Lord, that we would start serving you with this perfect, sincere heart. Please, I ask. As they begin to play, would you stand together with me if you're able to tonight? It's been a great place to be in God's house. And one of the, the things that would make it great and cap it off would be this. If the Lord has spoke to your heart, that you would make a holy vow to Him. You would complete what God has already started in your life. If, if the Holy Spirit has knocked on your heart's door to say, that preacher man said something that you ought to be paying attention to then I suggest you pay attention. If you found some hypocrisy in your life, if you found some things that you haven't been completely sincere in, sincerity is the key. If you're here tonight and the Lord has burdened your heart, you can make an altar out of your seat or you can make an altar out of this altar at the front. But I challenge you to do business with the Lord. If the Lord has swung down low and spoke to you about something, please don't walk out those doors without taking care of that business. As they continue to play, the group sang about the cross. It's all about the cross. Perhaps you're here tonight and... You know what that cross means vaguely, that Jesus went to it, but you've never received Christ as your personal Savior. You've heard so much talk about it. You've been to church with your friend, your family, your relatives, fiance, whoever. You've been to church a lot, but you've never made it personal, the transaction that was made on that cross that day and then the, the burial and resurrection that followed. You've never received Christ as your personal Savior. If you've never done that, 
I invite you to step out and come. I'm watching down here at the front. Brother Dan's down here on the front pew. Either one of us would be glad just to take a Bible and show you how you can be sure heaven's your home. As they finish out this verse, if God's speaking to you, I invite you to come. Father, now thank you for this time to be in your house. What a joy it's been to be blessed with some good music. Lord, the wonderful testimony of Miss Joanna's trip and the way you blessed her and kept her safe and then used her and the whole team to see people brought to faith. And I pray that you would bless all of them that were on it. Lord, thank you for the time to be in your word. Thank you for bringing the Snyders our way. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing the Proclaim team our way. Thank you for giving us such a good time tonight. I pray that you bless us as we go out. Keep us safe. Lord, I do pray for Lori Green, that you would bless her right now over at the hospital. Give the doctors great wisdom. I pray for Harry Vickers, dear Lord, that you'd bless him and his family in the loss of his sister Janice. And uh, Lord, pray that you would uh, just continue to bless. I pray for Karen, Brother Bob Bryant's sister, dear Lord, that you would just be especially close to her right now this evening as well. Lord, we'll thank you. You've been so good to us. You give us a wonderful night tonight. Thank you so much for all of your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. May look this way. I'm going to ask the Proclaim team to slip on back to the back, or maybe they already have some of them. Maybe you have some questions about Pensacola Christian College. It's a wonderful uh, Christian institution. Uh, they, they have... Um, uh, they stand strong on the biblical doctrines that they should, strong in the King James Bible, strong on, uh, uh, against Calvinism and the, 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 the just biblical Christianity. And uh, so it's a wonderful place. If you've got somebody that might be interested, I encourage you to check out uh, the institution. And uh, we're so blessed that they came our way. Thank you for being in church tonight. Brother Dan, we need anything else? All right. God bless you. You're dismissed.